Welcome to Sachs Realty's Tuesday night podcast, where we talk about anything and everything real estate. Each week, we deliver expert information, enabling you to make better informed decisions while keeping more money in your pocket. If you're interested in real estate, this is your show. Hey, hey, how's it going? Hi. All right, we're going to talk about the MLS tonight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're going to kind of take a deep dive in if you are house shopping right now and you probably start your search online. And tonight we're going to show you a couple things about the internet search sites and kind of break down the MLS and give you some good insights. Some of the things that are really important when you're looking for a house and uh, even before you get to a real estate agent, but we're also going to show you how important it is to be connected to a real estate agent because what you're looking for when you're looking for a house on sites like Zillow, truly a realtor.com and other sites just like those, you're actually not looking at the MLS. You're looking at aggregating sites. Not all of the information is there or not easily to find uh, as it would be if you are getting searches sent to you through the MLS from your real estate agent. Guys, I'm Todd Sachs. I'm the broker Sachs Realty and welcome. Tonight's a live show. I'm here with Melissa Levy. Melissa is my licensed assistant and actually helps us to really keep things together here at Sachs Realty um, at our corporate office. Melissa, thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be back. Yeah. And uh, let's start out off talking about some market updates because, oh man, there's a lot going on in the market right now. Things are changing. They really are. not what they used to be even a week ago. Yep. Yeah. Yep. You know, one of the biggest things that I see, and I've listened to a lot of other experts that talk on the topic of, uh, you know, the real estate market in general, and uh, a couple of things that I've been listening to, uh, they're really predicting some kind of a major downturn here, some type of a bubble bursting, uh, perhaps even this year, maybe third or fourth quarter of this year with a lot of uh, maybe foreclosures hitting the market. So before we dive into the MLS, just, let's just kind of go over some of those things that are happening right now. Yep. Let's talk about interest rates first, I think. Yeah. I think that that is what is, um, I know the buyers are looking and they're thinking about what they're going to do with their purchase and what's going on with the interest rates daily. Yeah, interest rates now, guys, if you're buying a house, looking to buy a house, um, if you have impeccable credit, really high credit scores, um, you're going to be in the probably low fives right now. Um, if you have any credit issues or you're going for FHA, financing, you don't have a whole lot of money down uh, and your credit is so-so, but still enough to get a house. Uh, I'm seeing things that are coming across the desk right now at uh, in the sixes. Mm -hmm. So in the low sixes to mid sixes with uh, mortgage insurance. Uh, so really the APR that you're looking at and what you're paying on your loan annually. And so we're definitely seeing a big difference that is up uh, really double from, you know, late last year. Um, and it's really changing the outlook and the affordability of, especially first time buyers that are looking to, you know, obtain the, obtain the dream of homeownership, you know, and just kind of like get out of renting where they are right now. And, um, you know, their mortgage payments are changing. So we're seeing that people are dropping, the amount of the house that they're looking for prices are still high uh, but i've been listening to a couple experts talk about some of the bigger pictures of what's happening in the housing market and sort of maybe some relief coming in sight uh, to at least the the pressure a little bit of down pressure maybe very soon on home prices uh, because things are just going like crazy right now and a lot of the home buyers wouldn't be able to do it without help gift money uh, because they're bidding on houses that are going for probably more than a praise value. But some of the down pressures that we're going to see is I was listening to somebody talk about population growth and they were saying that, you know, a lot of the people are saying that there isn't enough houses for the amount of people in the world or in the United States. And uh, some people say that that's just not true. 
that there are plenty of houses, especially houses in the pipeline, and that we're at one of the slowest population growth times that we've seen in decades. So what that could mean if we start to see a little bit of a bubble burst in this market, um, if we see some relief in the supply chain, we have a lot of new houses that are committed, uh, subdivisions that are underway, and builders have been limiting the amount of sales that they'll do every year or every month rather to about four or five new home sales per month. And that's really restricting the amount of new products that are hitting the market. A lot of that's due to supply chain. So I think once we start seeing supply chain loosening up, hopefully uh, we're going to start seeing some of these new houses hit the market. Uh, and it's a lot, it's a big number. Also, we're looking at record breaking numbers of people that are owning second homes right now. I think as we start to see inflation, um, maybe some of those people will stop uh, with the new, you know, those second homes and will kind of give them up and start putting some more products in the market, house product in the market. And then thirdly, the really the big item is they're estimating that by third and fourth quarter, we're going to see a lot of foreclosures coming and that's going to hopefully loosen up the market. So would you say with all this information coming in and, you know, what you've been reading that that is the time when we're going to see the shift is at the third and fourth quarter when the foreclosures start what it what's the insight on that you know I'm, I'm even seeing it happen more in a lot of markets across the u.s in the last week <clears throat> where we're seeing that houses in certain price points are sitting for longer days on the market and um and then we're starting to see where a lot of remorse could be causing a lot of the houses to come back to the market. And a lot of times what that means is a buyer gets excited uh, when they're first glancing at a, a house, walking through a house, they get excited, they put an offer in, they get excited in the bidding process, so they overpay. And they start realizing after they have a home inspection, even if it's as is, that maybe the house isn't what um, they bargained for, that it needs too many repairs, and then we're starting to see a lot of that uh, happen. And we're going to look at that tonight uh, mm -hmm. when we're talking about what buyers should know about the MLS and the search sites like Zillow, uh, Truly, uh, and Realtor.com, which are the ones that we're going to kind of deep dive into a little bit tonight. Let's talk about the overpaying. I mean, you meant you just mentioned that. Do you feel that you know the buyers right now are overpaying? Some of the experts are saying that when we get this down pressure on the market, some of the major markets, maybe like Florida, Texas, um, Tennessee, <clears throat> some of the experts are saying that we may start seeing um, market adjustments or corrections, as they call it, which could be about 10% mm. uh, from where prices are right now. Nobody really knows, but I think if we start looking at a house that is let's just say 400,000 and you're bidding 450,000 to get that house, um, that house might be worth 360. That is a huge difference. Yeah. So it could Something be. to think about. Yeah. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. And again, and the biggest thing that we're really looking at is if the house needs work. So a lot of times the buyers are buying these houses and some of the major operating systems need to be replaced. And that can really put them in a bind if they don't have extra cash, if they're using all their cash to buy. Yeah, absolutely. It's just going to be interesting to see when that trend is going to stop. You know, I tell you what, a lot of the same indicators, I mean, when you look at 2008, a lot of people were saying, you know, like it will never happen like 2008. Um, of course, we're not in the same financial crisis with mortgages as we were in 2008 but that still has nothing to do with the shift that could happen when more inventory hits the market and the down pressure on pricing starts to happen. You know, another thing is important to note too, is that we're seeing a, a huge demand right now in uh, multifamily housing apartments. Mm. And there are a lot of apartments that are under construction right now. So when we start seeing home inventory of these buyers that uh, will now be able to find houses to buy, uh, you know, the big concern will be on these big operators that are promising huge returns to investors, you know, in the high single digits uh, on annual returns on their investment. 
will those multifamily operators, when people start to find houses to buy, you know, what will happen when this inventory now and multifamily housing starts to become a glut? And uh, then we start seeing, you know, down pressure on leases, leasing, you know, which right now the landlords are really capitalizing on. Yeah. Uh, they're really taking advantage of the situation with, uh, you know, the renters and jacking up the rates. Yeah. Yeah, I know. We see it. And um, sometimes, you know, they're going up. I've seen it go up by as much as 500, which is incredible. Yeah, I know somebody right now, they're going up 800 a month. They go month to month in a 17, almost $1,800 a month lease is going to go up $800 a month for month to month. Yeah. Yeah. It's just big. That's big. Big change. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Definitely. Yes. So should we dive in? I'm ready. Yeah, let's talk about the MLS, guys. A lot of times, um, you know, your your home search, well, all the time, pretty much nowadays, the home search is starting on the internet. So you're visiting sites like we mentioned, Zillow, Truly, or Realtor.com are the big ones. Uh, and then you also visit sites like Saks Realty and any other real estate website where you're actually dialing in a little bit better uh, to what we have is the traditional MLS. So it's not just an aggregating site. A lot of people think that sites like Zillow uh, are the MLS and they're really not. They're just basically aggregating data and not all the data that you can find on the MLS. Yeah. So let's just kind of get into things here and uh, talk about when the MLS kind of started and how this whole thing, these sites came to be. Yeah. And there are some people, I just want to add to that. Some people think the MLS is an actual website as well. And they're not understanding that it's actually something that you need to subscribe to. And we're going to get into the specifics of that. But yeah. Exactly. And I know we've got some cool slides that we're going to go over tonight. Um, so uh, why don't we just get started with that? Yep. Sounds good. So here we are, guys. we got a map of the U.S. And uh, Melissa, what are we looking at here? So this right here shows you where all the MLSs are in our nation, in the United States. And there's 597 to be exact. And that number changes because um, there's been a lot of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Consolidation. Consolidation. Thank yeah. you. Yes. And um, so, but as of right now, there's 597, which to me, I can't believe it. In our region, we have one. Um, but yep as you can see. And then I found out in San Francisco, for example, they have four. So it just depends on the region where you live and how many you have. Um, but that just gives you, you know, an overview of how many we have. Yeah. And, you know, um, to kind of talk about back in the day, because back in the old days, when um, really in the 1800s, when brokerages had properties to sell, they had like these meeting places or auctions where they actually had what was known as real estate exchanges. So that was kind of like in the eight, 1900, late 1800s mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, 1880, 1890, somewhere around there. And, um, but yeah, the, the, uh, they sold properties almost like auctions. So people would come together. They, the brokers would talk about what they had and then they would just be prepared to bid on the properties and buy them right then and there. That's and exactly then as right. things kind of progressed, uh, they became a little bit more sophisticated and with real estate books. And this is how, and not that long ago, uh, you know, before the internet, if you wanted to buy property, uh, basically you would go to a real estate broker and they would, these publications would be made and circulated throughout the brokerages, like once every couple of weeks that would give all the updates and we're going to actually look at one of those in a second would we'll give all the updates on you know how they exchange the information so guys you could not find properties on your own without a real estate brokerage or agent uh, you really you were kind of lost so uh, then of course as we know it today the modern day uh, we have these aggregating sites and basically what they do is they're lead generation sites and we'll talk about that uh, but when you go on the site, you're actually, um, you know, these companies like Zillow sell your information. Basically, you contact Zillow and then they sell your lead to a real estate agent. 
So we're kind of looking at, um, you know, what it used to look like back in the day uh, when, you know, brokerages had these uh, books. Uh, we basically go over the information on the sellers, break it all down, and, um, and then would have the remarks. You can see down here it says, choice lot, beautiful view of golf course on prestigious Union Hills golf course, upgraded carpet, um, custom draperies, What's that say? Exterior recently painted. So that's your that's your wonderful description here on uh, this <laughs> this particular listing. <laughs> it's really cool to see, though. I would really love to see get my hands on one of those books. It's really neat. You know, I think uh, one of our agents, Clark, he probably he's been in the business for a long time. Yeah, he has. He's been selling for a long time, over thirty years. I think that he remembers those books. I actually got my license in 2005, though I'd been in construction a lot earlier. I'm really not down with the books so much other than the real estate book, which right. was a marketing book that uh, you would pick up when you went to your local grocery store or sub shop or something like that. Yeah. Uh, and that's how people searched really before the internet and then into the days of the internet. Yeah. Yep. I remember it well. So how are we getting stuff today? So today we there's many options. There's obviously Zillow, Realtor.com, Trulia. You can go to our page, SaxRealty.com, but any brokerage page. Um, you know, you'll be able to search properties that way. But the big one is Zillow. That's where, you know, the majority of people go to do their home searching at home. And on the Zillow their and Trulia, but they yep. Zillow owns Trulia, so Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, they definitely have the market share of eyeballs on properties for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And who populates so, the MLS? Yeah. So licensed brokerages like Saks Realty, you have to be a member of the L MLS, but also they're authorized agents and representatives. So, um, you know, uh, admins can enter things into the MLS, but that's really you know, when you think about it, Zillow is not populating this data, right? No. And there are a lot of sites out there that are, um, you know, partial service type of or limited service um, brokerages out there that will help sellers get their information on the MLS. Uh, but it really is garbage in, garbage out. You know, it's really based on, um, you know, the agent, for the most part, putting the information in. And that's really going to you know, determine what you as a buyer gets to see mm -hmm. when you're looking for a house. And really what we want to do, because um, because so many buyers are looking online themselves, even as investors, and we have a lot of investors that want to buy rental properties and they go online um, really to, uh, to try and find properties themselves. We really want to kind of go over how to um, discern the information, you know, how to really decipher the information, how to um, know whether it's something that you should or in really interest you or not. Um, and then whether you're, you know, because so many people waste their time, they go out to listings without or to houses without really reading the information that's available. And then when they find out the information, they go, ah, you know, I'm not interested in this house anymore. And you've wasted a lot of time and maybe even some opportunities. Yeah, that's a hundred percent true. Um, and I'd love to dive into this this list if that's okay with you. Um, but the first one being, and we, I was doing some searching on Zillow today, and I will show you guys that here momentarily. Um, but with the estate sales, we seem to call it estate sales in Maryland. I'm finding um, in my searching, they are probate sales. It's one and the same. But there are benefits, um, you know, with the estate sales, pros and cons, obviously, to both. But, um, you know, this estate sales, usually what we find is it's multiple people that are involved in the sale of the um, property. They most likely haven't lived in the property, so they may not be able to disclose everything about the property because they don't know. And they are probably more likely to, if you were negotiating with them, um, you know, let's just say there were four people. If you were negotiating and let's just say $5,000 in price, they would probably be more apt because it's all going to be divided. So it's not going to be a big hit to them. Um, 
Anything else you want to say about that, Todd? That can go both ways. Yeah. So when you guys are looking for properties, there are a lot of types of listings. Uh, you know, you may be thinking that it's just active, it's for sale. Uh, but like Melissa is saying, you know, with the state sales and probate sales, and you can search for those listings in the keywords a lot of times in sites like Zillow. And so if you, and we'll, we'll show you in a second here, but the big thing is, as Melissa was saying, is that you have to understand if it's an estate sale, the chances are, you know, in a lot of states, and I'm not really familiar with too many states, some, uh, but a lot of states, there are disclosure forms. And like in Maryland, you can, that's one required form. It's either a disclosure or disclaimer. And a disclosure is where the seller tells you everything they know about the house, how old the roof is, um, you know, how old the for HVAC, uh, if they know of any problems in the house, things that work, um, or they can choose to disclaim. So in Maryland, it's a four page form. The last page is a disclaimer, and they can basically tell you that they're not gonna tell you anything, and but they don't know of anything like a latent defect or a hidden whatever that uh, that they have knowledge of that you should know. They, they don't have that. So um, they, but they don't wanna tell you anything else. Well, when you're dealing with people that have never lived in the house or it's been 20 years since they grew up in the house, they, they're excluded from filling out that form. And in different states, you know, they have different laws on disclosure, but usually they're not going to tell you anything when it's an estate sale about the house because they may not know. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a kid that hasn't lived in the house for 20 years um, and one of their parents you know, has passed. Um, but like Melissa was saying, when you get into bidding, usually when we're dealing with estate sales, it's really, it just comes down to the best deal for the people selling the house. They don't have to do anything. A lot of times they don't want to do anything. And, you know, so, you know, when somebody comes in with a cash deal and maybe it's not the highest price, but let's say the house is listed at 400, you have a $400,000 offer. And then you have these, you know, homeowners that are going to move in for 410, but they have all these strings attached. $10,000 may not mean a whole lot to uh, family members when there's three of them or four of them or more. And they're scattered about different states. They a lot of times they just want their money. That's you right. take ten grand and divide it between four people, and you're like, it's twenty five hundred bucks a piece. I'd rather take the cash for ten thousand dollars less. Yeah. Um, so a lot of times, you know, just know what you're dealing with with probate, state sales, and yeah, then short sales. Go ahead. I just wanted to add one other mo um, top th thing I have on my mind for the estate sales. It does not mean the in not all conditions, but estate sales does not mean the entire contents of the house is up for sale with the estate sale. Um, right. And also it doesn't necessarily mean someone has died in the home either. This is, this is very true. Hang yes. on one second. Yeah, Keep of course. Talking, Melissa, my battery is getting ready to go. I need to charge up. I am yeah, out go of ahead. office right now. Yeah, okay, sure. So that's just something that you should know that, um, you know, with the estate sale, I know sometimes you think, and you hear estate sales, you hear that people are going to be, um, you know, shopping or um, they have these kind of like a yard sale, but they call it estate sales. That's something completely different than the actual listing of the estate sale. And while we have a moment, Joe, do you want to um, show my Zillow screen here? And I can actually show on Zillow how you can search for the estate sale. Um, for example, I just did in my search, I'm doing the whole state of Maryland, as you can see, and you just kind of scroll down to the bottom here and where it says keywords, if you put in estate sale and you click done, these are all estate sales. For example, I am just going, let me just click on one of these here, like this one, for example, and I'm just going to scroll down here in the remarks section. Bear with me one moment. And you're going to see that. Let's see here. Facts and features. Well, this isn't a good example. Give me one more second. I'm going to show you another one. But what happens is, is that they will show you that it's an actual estate sale. And um, so it's a good way of searching. Um, let's see here. Read more. 
and it says an estate sale right there. So you know. So using that more button on the Zillow site is a really good way to narrow down um, exactly what you're looking for when it comes to something as an example as an estate sale. Okay. Well, we continue and we can talk about um, the potential short sale and, um, you know, what that exactly means. And that is um, where the mortgagor might take less money to free up the title of the home. And um, usually there's a short sale negotiator that works on behalf of a seller to reach a short sale approval with a bank or another lender. And, um, so that's, and again, you could most likely put in, in the searching, you can do a short sale here and, um, up they will come. And so you can, in case you're searching for that as well, um, let me do one right here and this will likely say that it was listed as a short sale. So you would be able to, um, right here, properties being sold as with no warranties, property being sold as a short sale. So that's just another way to search, um, kind of pinpoint down what you're looking for. And um, that's what it's like to do a short sale. Todd, I was just reviewing. Um, I moved on from the estate sales to the short sales. Yeah. Yeah, so you covered, I'm sure, short sales, a lot of people don't understand is, um, you know, there's potential short sales and then there, you know, there, we know they're short sales and basically the property is not worth what the bank or the liens that are on the property. And what has to happen there is there's a lot of risk on the uh, buyer because they have to wait. Uh, sometimes it could take a long time. I've seen short sales take 10 months, a year. Uh, you have to really want the house. And um, and usually the people are still living in it. So a lot of times there are already determined uh, prices that amounts that the bank will take. So in other words, let's say the house is listed for $350,000 and uh, the bank said, hey, you know what, we'll take three twenty five. dollars um, as a sale price, if they have already established that the seller, you know, has been going through financial trouble, they've established um, through, you know, having a real estate broker look, or agent look at the house and give them comps and determine what the the real value is of the property. A lot of times that's already been worked out, and um, you know, you have an opportunity to come in and buy the house. But a lot of times these houses are really distressed. You know, if people, you know, not all the time, but if people are struggling paying their mortgages, a lot of times they have been really deferring maintenance that has been happening over a period of time. And it can just, you know, you can be buying yourself, you know, a big project. Yeah, definitely. Joe, can we um, go back to that slide? Thank you so much. Perfect. And then pre foreclosures, we could talk about that because, you know, sort of what happens is somebody stops paying their house and then, um, you know, they may try and sell it at short sale. And if they can't sell it, or a lot of times they won't go for a short sale, then it just go into foreclosure. Mm -hmm. And um, really, foreclosures um, are when the bank is kind of taking back the house. And there could be a couple different steps to this um they may already own it which is the bottom one here bank owned property um but foreclosures a lot of times you'll see and if you're on auction sites a lot of times you'll see foreclosures and um and you can search that on zillow too i mean you can search pre-foreclosures foreclosures uh but a lot of times what's happening is the occupant still living in the house so in many cases when you're searching uh, for foreclosures, or you see that it's a foreclosure and you're interested, a lot of times they don't have pictures of the inside and you're not allowed to go inside. And it will say things like unlawful to disturb the occupant. 
or you know, do not trespass, that it would be unlawful to trespass. So a lot of this is really reserved to people that are investors, you know, that are, will be buying a lot of these types of properties because they may buy it no matter what condition, they may buy it without seeing the inside. But a lot of times when you're buying foreclosures, it's the burden is up to the, the new owner to verify that it's vacant or to evict the occupants, which a lot of times could be squatters, could be the tenants that have been in there not paying the owner, um, or it could be the owner themselves. Yeah, I mean, that, as we know, is a whole process and it can take months. So you really got to think, is that a road you want to go down with the foreclosures? You could be getting an amazing deal, but you also may not even be able to put your hands on that property for potentially six months um, or more. So just something to think about. That's right. I mean, especially now, you know, trying to pick people, um, you know, with post COVID, I mean, they are doing evictions. I think in most of the states, uh, some of the states are still, I think, October, I heard uh, some states this year, uh, you know, where they will allow landlords to evict. Uh, but a lot of the states are allowing you to evict, but it's a it's a terrible process, uh, not something, you know, that, uh, that most people want to do in their lifetime. And then finally, talking about the bank-owned properties, so the foreclosures in the process, the banks foreclosing, and then really when you're dealing with bank owned properties, a lot of times the banks nowadays will even put some money into the property and fix it up, uh, make sure that uh, a buyer can get a loan, get a mortgage. And uh, so they may be putting money into the property, but a lot of times they don't. And the big thing that I want to talk about when you're looking at houses online uh, that are bank owned is I want people to understand because a lot of investors make this mistake, investors that don't really know uh, what they're doing uh, when they're buying properties. A lot of them think, you know, if a house is listed for, let's just say $300,000, it's bank owned and they go and preview the house and the house is distressed and they say, we're going to offer them $250,000. Your offer is getting rejected. I mean, it's not even being considered. Uh, one of the things that I want you to realize when you're dealing with bank owned property is that they'll let the house sit on the market. They will bring it down incrementally. So these um, the people that are in charge of, you know, um, accepting or getting these contracts accepted, they only have a couple percent uh, variable that they have to work within from the list price. And then what happens is then they will allow time to lapse before they reduce the price again. And a lot of times the strategy works really well uh, for the banks and uh, kind of slows the process down because you know, it really makes the investor or the owner um, really make sure that they want the property. There's a reason why they want it and they're willing to pay more for it uh, over time. You know, if it doesn't sell, they will drop the price, but it can take a year before you see a price that may be worth uh, your interest. And then you find out if you don't stay on top of that property for that long of a period, somebody just buys it for the yeah. price you would have bought it for. So that's the things yeah. I've, that's what I've heard with short sales and um, the bank owned properties that the process can just really take a long time. So it's just, what were you going to say, Todd? No, it's not a bad strategy. I mean, if you're a home buyer and you know, you're renting a place right now and, and maybe your lease comes up in five or six months, or maybe you had to re up, um, you know, looking at any potential short sales may be an avenue that knocks out a lot of the buyers. So it may be a process that you're willing to take. Um, and, you know, you may be successful doing something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I think it all depends on obviously your situation, but. And the quality of the property too, because not all short sales are in bad shape. Yeah. Yep. Very true. Very, you know? very true. So let's kind of go over the listing statuses because. You know, I, I think that a lot of people, they don't really understand and I want to dive in. And this is where I help really help buyers win. And, you know, a lot of times buyers don't understand. I get a first time buyer that is limited on the amount of money that they can afford on monthly payments and they're limited on their down payment. And they want to jump out of the gate right away. They want to go see that house day one on the market. 
And what's happening is that's when all of the real activity is starting to happen, where the highest competition is on the property. I would say in the first three to five days with that property, um, if it's a hot listing, it's going to hit the market. And, you know, basically the pressure is going to be on the buyers. But then sometimes things happen. And sometimes things happen to really good properties. And the reason is because of maybe agents that are inexperienced or sellers that are overzealous, greedy, and it backfires on them. And then what happens is if you're a savvy buyer and you have a little patience and you can be cool headed, um, a lot of times you can prevail and come away with a house that you really love and not get crushed on overpaying. So, um, Melissa, you want to just kind of run down this list and then we'll kind yeah, of dive in I and do. talk about how we, you know, ways that we can yep. use these types of um, statuses to our advantage. Mm -hmm. So coming soon, I mean, it's it, it's coming soon. So that's a 21 day period of time before you and your seller have actually, it's your seller who has chosen with your guidance, the day you're going to go active, 21 periods. This is where you get all your marketing done, get ready to go. Um, so uh, when it's active, when it hits the market on active day, it is a hundred percent ready. So you have that ramp up time and then you're ready out of the gates, get it active. And that's when, you know, you have everyone coming to your house. And then once you go, once you have the offer, you accept the offer, it's either going to be active under contract or pending. And the yeah, well, let's just kind of stop there for a minute. Let's sure. just talk about coming soon because it's not always 21 days, right? It's up to 21 days. It's up to 21 days. It's up to Thank 21 you. days. A lot yep. of times agents don't even use this option. And the big thing that I want to talk about here is that um, coming soon is really, and this is the big difference here, guys, because if you're looking to buy a house, my recommendation is you get with an agent because an agent is going to connect you directly to the MLS. When you're looking on Zillow, they're not the MLS, all right? They are a brokerage firm, just like we are at Saks Realty. Um, they sell leads, not saying don't use their site. A lot of people like it because it's cool. It's an easy site to use. But the difference is a real estate agent's MLS or a broker's MLS, same thing, is going to give you better data and more insight. So not all of the coming soon. So these are houses. You're frantically looking for a house. You're competing on the market day one when it hits the market and you want to run out and take a look at it. Well, if you are connected to an agent that can send you things that are in coming soon, even if they're only utilizing that for a couple of days in a coming soon status while they're waiting for things like the sign to get installed or brochures to be made or professional photography to be edited for them to upload it to the MLS, you can jump in your car and drive around the neighborhood and check it out. Not only that, we're going to look at the actual statuses and, uh, you know, the tax records of the property to try and get some intel. Um, and we're going to look at that in a second, but intel like, well, how long has the owner had this property? Uh, you know, was it recently sold a year ago or six months ago? Could it be a flip or a renovation? Um, so you can start really doing, if you're connected to an agent and they send you coming soon listings, you're going to really have an edge on everybody else that doesn't have an agent and is relying solely on sites like Zillow, Trulia, Realtor.com. But the important thing is, is that you can search on Zillow for coming soon. Um, basically what happens, the coming soon status is reserved for the industry and their clients, their buyers. Okay. But what happens is if you are a premier agent on Zillow, all right, you can actually have your coming soon aggregated to the, the Zillow site. The problem is, is most people don't know how to look for it. Uh, so when they're searching properties, they're not looking for coming soon because they don't know where to find it. And then also they're thinking that that's all the information's out there. And there's so many other coming soons that you would not even believe. And trust me, what I'm telling you in the market, if I look at 20 actives right now in a, in a major market, um, you know, a zip code, uh, you know, of any market, 
they're at least half of or a quarter or a half of those at least that you're not looking at because they're in coming soon status. Uh, so you're really missing the mark by not making sure that you have that. And then what happens is they go active. The feeding frenzy begins. The pressure's on. A couple things are happening. Either one, it's high activity in the first couple of days or there isn't. And that's going to tell you a whole lot about that property and its desirability. Yeah, absolutely. And just really quickly, um, Joe had mentioned to me that your love mic is not selected. Um, he would like you to please switch back on that. <laughs> All, right. all right. So just wanted to mention that. Gotcha. I'm having um, all kinds of fun. It's okay. You know, issues being out of the office here. It's all right. No problem. Um, all right, go ahead. Take it away. So, yeah, yeah absolutely. Through. So that is, um, that's what the coming soon is. And as Todd said, you can actually search for coming soon. You can actually search on Zillow. So I'll show you how to do that. Joe, if you want to switch on over to my page really quick, what you do here is. You should be good. Can you hear me better? Joe, Joe gave a thumbs up. up. Yep. He's good to go. Thank you. Right here, when you're doing the search where it says for sale, if you do this drop down bar right here, you're going to have the option to click the coming soon. And there you're going to be able to see all those coming soon. So that's something that's a feature that, you know, a lot of people miss because this little arrow here, you're only seeing for sale, for rent, sold, you know, unless you do that little drop down, that's where you're going to see it. And that's where you're going to be able to capture all that information. Um, yeah, and it's important to say too is that you know this is not intended. When an agent loads up their listing and coming soon, they're basically saying that they take all responsibility for whether they get fined by their MLS for publishing mm -hmm. the coming soon. Because again, yep. it's supposed to be protected to the industry, the agents, and their buyers. Yes, yes. Um. So yeah. So that's coming soon. That's what it's all about. And, um, after the coming soon stage, you go right into active and active is active. I mean, first day on the market, you're probably at this, at this, in this market, you're having many showings, many people coming into, you know, your property and taking a look. Um, and probably in a very short period of time, you're going to have offers and that, did, Todd, did you want to say something there? Well, I just want to pull up. Let's go ahead and look at one of these listings in, you know, one of these houses, obviously around 28,000. It's a lot. And who knows where the heck this is, but yeah. Let me, anyway, I let's just check that. out one of these listings on the right-hand side and kind of pull it up. Uh, just take that 315 oh, sure. right there. Yep. Yep, and let's just kind of look at it and sort of decipher what we're looking at. Uh, because, you know, again, now we're starting to dive into your buyer. You're looking for a house. You're on Zillow. And, you know, this happens to be, let's just say you want to be in Capitol Heights, three bedroom, two bath, thousand square feet, $315. And let's go ahead and scroll down and just kind of look at some of this data. You've got a map view um, and then you have an overview. And it's really, this is where it's telling you the time on Zillow. So this is kind of important stuff because when things have been on the market for a while and they're still active, you're going, why is this house? I mean, we've been in the craziest market ever. You know, why am I looking at a house that's been on the market for nine months mm -hmm. and, um, you know, and it hasn't sold yet. So we're going to kind of show you what to look for there. Uh, but, you know, we're kind of cruising down through here. It's had 131 views, nine saves, uh, kind of gives you who the listing agent is on the property, the MLS number. And then really it's asking if you want to take a tour with a buyer's agent. And here guys is what a lot of people don't realize. And being a Zillow premier agent, I have um, advertised with Zillow before. And basically a lot of people call up and they want to know information about this house here at 4107 Ellis street. We happen to be looking at. Mm -hmm. And what happens is they're like, you know, they think I'm the listing agent. And one of the things I want you to understand when you're on a site like this is that uh, Zillow is selling your lead. So when you hit that, you want to see this at Thursday, April 14th, and you pick a time, you request a time, they're kicking that out to an agent that's paying them to advertise. And that's who's calling you up. So a lot of times, if you have an agent already, don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> All you're doing is making things very convoluted and confusing. Use your agent, call your agent up and tell them that you want to see this. You can save it. You can share it. Um, you know, if you want to go ahead and 
go on sites like this ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Let's go down through the facts and features. And this is kind of where we talk about garbage in, garbage out. This is giving you all the details of the property, um, interior details, uh, you know, what type of appliances, whether it's gas, things like that. Um, so you can expand that. But remember, if the agents aren't loading and populating this information right, uh, this information is going to be wrong because this is where when we talk about the MLS aggregating, the this is aggregating the MLS, the agents are the ones that are putting this information in or uh, admins that could be putting it in incorrectly and that's what you're getting. So mm -hmm. it's up to you to really verify. They're going to say things like all information deemed to be correct, uh, but you're going to have to do your due diligence to make sure that it is. So we keep scrolling down here. And uh, one of the things that I want to point out here is really what happens when, and keep on going, where sure. we get to um, the history of this property, which is really important. Um, here we're looking at HOA. She's scrolling. Keep going. Mm -hmm. And, you know, contact the agent. That's where you can fill out another way to get a hold of the agent. And there's estimate 241, which is a lot less than the listing price. And I want to just stop here for a second because this number changes. So I've listed houses where Zillow's little robot comes up and says, hmm, we must be doing something wrong because uh, the their list price is much higher than what we're calculating in our estimate. And, you know, this is basically doing a sales range and, uh, the 241, as you can see, is much lower. There must be a reason. They, this will adjust. So hopefully the agent did their proper due diligence in you know, pricing this property. And what we find is this estimate will update in a couple of days to be close to, if not right at the list price, uh, which is kind of weird. Um, and I think one of the reasons why <laughs> they stop with their offers program, because I think they had admitted that their algorithm couldn't keep up with today's market. So price and tax history, this is what I want to kind of dive into here. And we have a slide that's going to show a little bit better, um, you know, examples of this. But if we're looking, this is the tax history here. If we just keep scrolling. Okay. Yeah, it was listed for sale on 412. But let's go ahead and pull up our slide for a second. Sure. Because guys, this is what I want you to deep dive into. If you're looking at a property and you are um, sort of, you know, going through and looking at the. Um, that was the right. one, Joe. That was the one. Yep. Yeah, there you go. There we go. All right. So when you're on what we were just looking at on Zillow, um, what I want to kind of focus in on is the history, the price history of the property, because this is where you can really win big time if you're looking for properties that have had issues and not all issues are bad issues. So I want to kind of talk about things like the last time this was sold, this property that we pulled up here was sold in uh, 8, 18 of 2010. So that's when this owner has that owns it now bought this property. So they've had it for 12 years. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what happened is in January, I think it says, what does it say? January 5th or 6th, is 6th, I think. Um, it was listed for sale. And then the price, it seems like it's been the same the whole time. But on 115, okay, a week later, this thing is pending. Then it's important that we look at, okay, something happened. So 115, they took a contract. It was a pending sale. It was off temporarily, you know, it was down from being active right but then here it is a month later on 214 it's listed for sale again mm -hmm. so this is important because we have to think about what could have possibly happened right why could this property have gone back on the market again and when we're looking at something like a month it's probably financing because a lot of times the contracts nowadays we're seeing closing within 30 days but it could be other things. It could be that it was contingent upon the seller finding a place to buy um, or them getting their other house. Uh, it could have been that the buyer 
it was contingent on the buyer selling another house. But when we're looking at a 335 price range, you go, okay, could they have been selling, could it have been the buyer that was trying to sell a house for 200,000? Maybe, um, but whatever it was, it was 30 days. The important thing here is that there was disappointment in the sellers, whatever, they were disappointed. They tried to sell this thing, they put on the market, a week later, they took an offer. A month later, it fell through, right? Mm -hmm. Then something else happened. Now, when we're looking at those dates, okay, from a pending sale, let's just say it was only off the market for 10 days. A lot of times we're seeing now inspections and the inspection may be as is with the right to terminate. The average inspection times, say five to seven days, um, the buyer gets in, they have remorse, whatever. They look at the house. It's not what they thought it was. They don't want it anymore. Regardless, here we're back. What happens? The seller is disappointed, right? So imagine putting yourself in the position of the seller and you're like, do are people going to want my house when I put it on the market? You put it on the market and then all of a sudden, bam, you get a contract for whatever reason it falls through. You're thinking, wow, did we take the wrong offer, right? Now what's happening? Well, we're going to go through this one, particularly on the 28th, they took it off the market. They just said, you know what? Let's just take it off the market. Now, what could have happened here? Well, it could have been repairs that were necessary. They could have just been fed up. They could have whatever changed agents. Yeah. But what's happening here? Sellers again, they're frustrated. They're disappointed. Things are happening, right? It's not always great for the sellers, even when it's a great house. It could be very frustrating times. The big thing is they take the wrong contract, the wrong offer. Um, sometimes it's greed. I hate to say it, but sometimes they're greedy. We have a saying here in the real estate business, your first, your best, your first offer is usually your best offer. Um, but anyway, let's continue down this uh, rabbit trail here. But on 228, they decided, you know what, let's just take this thing off the market for whatever reason. And then on 3.30, they decide to put it back on the market again. And now we're at 4.7, and it's a pending sale again. Now, can you imagine these people are like on pins and needles, right? They've been trying to sell this house in the seller's market since January. It's a long time. It's a long time. So, guys, if you are in a position to where, you know, you can wait um, or, you know, you're kind of pressed on stressed out, like at your top of your market and, you know, you want to buy something. Maybe the thing to do is change your search parameters to instead of looking at things that just hit the market in one day, bump it out seven days or 10 days. You may see something like this with a perfectly nice house that a lot of the other buyers are sitting back on, eh, must be something wrong with that house, pass. Right? I think that's what this kind of market has done is that make people super picky and super selective where before they would have, you know, maybe looked at different options. But so that's a very good point. I think, you know, buyers need to think about that. We have noticed that with our own buyers that, you know, the homes that have been on the market, there's you know, in our, there's nothing wrong with them and they're, it's a perfectly good home and it's perfect for them and everything works. And it was a really good strategy to just, um, go to the homes that have been on the market for a little while. Yeah. And again, I mean, so if you focus in on these things and then you know what to ask for, or, you know, because a lot of times when you're looking at houses that were off the market because of a home inspection, a lot of times you, you can get that copy of the home inspection. A lot of times they become material facts and, you know, the agents have to disclose it and believe it or not, more times than not, they end up fixing what it was that was wrong. So where a lot of buyers are just saying, you know what, we're flaking out here because this house, obviously nobody wants it or something's wrong. You may have a situation where it's a perfectly good house. Things have been fixed and, you know, um, you can get yourself a good deal even in this market. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. And we see it daily. Yep. And one of the other things that I want to just kind of mention is that sometimes you have to change your search parameters 
And some of that is even price. And one of the things that I want to kind of just go over right now about price, because I see a lot of agents make this mistake for their buyers. Um, let's say that your top end is $400,000. You're buying a house, your top end's $400,000. I would recommend that even in this market, and your agent may disagree with you, but not all agents are created equally. And um, I'm here to tell you, do this anyway. But what I would say is if your home search price is $400,000, I would say start looking for houses that are 420 or 425, um, all the way up to that. Uh, you could even get them to separate the search if you want, so that you're specifically getting this and then bump the days on the market to seven. Uh, seven plus days on the market, bump it up 20 or $25,000 and see what else is there. You would be amazed that even going up a dollar to $400,001, that it may even pick something else up that you could be missing. I'm exaggerating with a dollar, but you get my point mm -hmm. by just bumping it up a little bit. Uh, because what happened is you, if you look at a property history, like we just saw, um, you may see where they would do a price reduction. And when it, you might be right on the edge of that price reduction. So the agent's getting ready to drop the price, but because it's been sitting there, you pick it up and say, hey, this house is at 410 or 415, but it's been on the market for 37 days. The agent could basically say, hey, look, I got a client that's maxed out at 400 grand. Will your seller consider that if the deal's right? Guess what? You know, you might find it out, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's a very good point. And there are deals being done out there um, where there are, you know, seller concessions as well. So that's just something else to think about um, that it's it's not all crazy. And there are deals in there. You just have to find them, be led and guided by your realtor. Um, but yeah, I think it's just things to think about. So what else did we, anything else you want to cover? So did we, I don't, I don't believe we went over everything with the um, different statuses. I think we just want to touch on that super briefly. We just kind of stopped in the middle. Joe, do you mind putting that slide back up for me? By the, by the way, guys, if you're looking to buy a house, we would love to help you. We have a broker network all over the country. If you reach out to me anytime, uh, would be happy to point you in the direction if you're in need of a great agent. And if you're in Maryland and you're looking, certainly we can help you ourselves uh, and we'd love to do so. So we help buyer sellers, renters, landlords uh, of both residential and commercial property. And if you're watching this video and it's something that you like uh, to hear more about, you know, real estate or everything, anything real estate on our Tuesday night podcast, uh, but we do post other videos as well. We just posted one about private septic systems. So uh, we would love to have you subscribe to our channel. If you give this video a thumbs up, it will help the algorithms push it out to other people that would benefit from hearing this podcast. Yeah. And also just another thing, I know we kind of blew through Zillow um, really quick, just a really, you know, little snapshot of what there is to offer, but um, we could probably give you some more additional info if you, I know Todd has, um, you know, people that reach out to him all the time and just something to put out there in case, because I know that was very quick. Um, but just going over the rest of the statuses, a lot of you probably are set up with your agent and you will see these things coming through. And just to have an example, like a What's wrong? definition of what all these are, that would just be helpful. We went over the coming soon. We went over the active. There's a difference between active under contract and pending. This is when your offer is accepted by um, when you're a buyer by the seller. And when it's active under contract, what that means is that you the seller is deciding to still show that property. So there's probably contingencies in there. Um, that maybe someone's waiting to sell their home and that they're going to keep on bringing people that are interested in. But that's just something very important to know. Pending is. Yeah. And before we even move. It. Yeah. And let's before we even move on that. I, that's a great point. So I want to make sure that you guys that are listening and you have real estate agents, we want to make sure that you're getting active under contract because a lot of times they don't include that. They'll give you coming soon and active only. Uh, but active under contract, based on what we just talked about, 
A lot of these properties come back on the market. So if it's active under contract, that usually means that they have reason to believe that there are contingencies that could fall, make the property fall through. Uh, a lot of times, like we were talking about, maybe the buyer has a house to sell. So there's a home sale contingency. Um, and if they, they have a certain period of time, there may be even a kickout clause. And what that means is if you go and look at that property and you still want to see it and you like it, you can put an offer in and that buyer can get kicked out if they don't remove the contingency, let's just say in 48 hours. So make sure that your agent is giving you things that are active under contract. Mm -hmm. Very, very good point. Um, and then moving on the temporarily off market, which we discussed before the property has been taken off the market. For well, I think we skipped pending. Oh, pending. Just we're not, it's, the offer has been accepted and we're not showing the property anymore. The seller is no longer showing the property. So that's what that, what that one is all about. And um, the days on the market have paused for that as well as the active under contract and the days on the market. That's what that DOM uh, abbreviation means is temporarily off the market that is paused there. And it's been te temporarily taken off the market for a set period of time. Could be any reason could be repairs being done, could be a uh, personal matter. I mean, it could really be, there's multitude of reasons why. And then withdrawn, the property has been taken off the market for an extended period of time and the days in the let's, market. Yeah. And let's just go back to temporary, temporarily off the market because yep. here's when we see things that like repairs. So let's just say that, you know, a inspection falls through you know, causes the sale to fall through. So what happens is um, at that point, the house would be tempor temporarily taken off the market for those repairs to be done. So that's actually a very interesting thing to see in that history. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. Um, and with the withdrawn, the property has been taken off the market for an extended period of time. The days on the market have paused and it will reset when a new listing is added after the previously listing has been in withdrawn status for consecutive 61 days. Yeah. And back in the day, agents, they used to kind of give properties a new MLS number. And so what would happen is if you had a property that you listed for sale and it was on the market, let's say for four months and um, it's kind of stale. You know, people are like, it's not showing up and people searches as new hot properties. And the agent would basically take it down, create a new MLS number, populate it. And then all of a sudden it's like a new property hitting the market again with one day on the market. So the MLS said, you know what, we're going to stop that. So if you withdraw a property off of the MLS, you can no longer do that strategy um, it has to be off the market for a full 61 days to reset the days on the market. So if you take it down, think about putting it up with a brand new MLS number, you'll get a new MLS number, but your days on the market will stay with that property. Mm -hmm. And expired, the contract of the listing has expired. What that means is that when you sign a listing agreement, you have a certain period of time that you are going to be the agent for that seller. And um, it ends. It has a start date and it has an end date. And you have to enter that into the MLS when you enter the listing. And once it hits that date, that listing becomes expired. So um, that's what expired means and um, canceled. The contract for the listing has been canceled. The days on the market have stopped and will reset on the 61st day after being placed in that status. And then closed. Closed is both sale and rental listings um, to indicate a successful closing. And there you That's have right. it. Yeah. That's it. Yes. All right. Good stuff. And we really appreciate you guys watching tonight. Hopefully you got some good value about the MLS and how to search for a home. Uh, hopefully you're a little bit smarter now and you're going to dive in a little deeper and kind of uh, explore with the search sites a little bit differently. And uh, Melissa, thanks for 
hanging in there, man, and kind of carrying me for, you know, battery dying. I don't Anytime. know what else happened. Mike went out. It's all right. It's part of it. It's life. The internet okay. kind of faded on me a little bit. I'm going to actually, uh, I don't know. It's all good. Take a nap. <laughs> <laughs> it wore me out, man. <laughs> all right, guys. Well, thanks a lot. I appreciate you all. And uh, for watching, tune again. And until next week, we will see you soon.